switch. <laughs> okay, welcome, welcome, welcome to this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about OWASP SAM, which is a security assurance program. Uh, it's, the, it's the Google Maps of, of software security, application security. And today we will mainly focus on the overall uh, structure and description of SAM. We're not going to do the actual hands-on training. So this is part of a full day training for OWASP SAM, where we typically go into each specific security practice, 15 of them. Um, but we're not going to do that. It will be just the introduction part. Uh, we, we will also look into some practices which are very applicable for our firm. And I'm going to show you things that we will be working on in the next year in, in, as, as part of our security strategy. Um, before we start, some terms of reference that could be relevant. So uh, we, I, I see application, so definition of the application in, in the SAM context is a separately managed system, subsystem or component. And it is important to mention that from SAM perspective, you should look into an application as uh, you should see the separation based on administrative characteristics rather than a business description. So for instance, the attendance uh, radar, the app and the web application could be two different applications. Uh, rather than one, you could group them separately. A portfolio is a collection of applications um, within the scope of a particular entity and the product owner is the person who's accountable for, for a specific portfolio. Okay, let's, let's first talk about why we're here, what is the problem, why do we even talk about security? Life would be so much easier without security. Now, you know that, well, you should definitely know this, that software evolution, especially in the past 20 years, has become very, very fast due to a lot of factors like complexity, technology, and security is always playing catch uh, in that aspect. There is also not too much teaching around that, so teaching isn't really catching up. If you attend a university, nowadays there are some programs for cybersecurity, but it is still questionable what they teach. Well, you can tell us about that later on. Uh, we have one uh, colleague who did actually a master's program on cybersecurity. Uh, you, you could actually tell us more once you go through several months at Codific and then compare how much of that you've seen in, at the university. Um, now, the, I'm pretty sure you heard about the triangle of the trade-off. You have cost on one side, speed of the de de development speed on the other side and the quality on the third side. And as you know, quality is typically pushed away we want a product and we want it now. There is much less focus on quality and there, there is even way less focus on security because it's less tangible. So if your product doesn't scale, if your system starts to break after five users, you're going to see it way faster than security. You know things are, there are problems with security once you've been hacked and then it's already too late. Um, and yeah, most of the problems appear from the application. So applications are number, number one attack vectors for cyber criminals. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this sort of graph. So if you have your, your total cost of software increases exponentially over time. This is not only due to security and not only due to bugs, uh, but it is partially due to bugs which increase over time uh, and flows typically go down over time. So there are less and less flows which are design issues and the more and more bugs and the cost of maintenance goes exponentially up. So the, the point here is, what I'm trying to make is, it pays off if you detect security issues as early as possible in a software development lifecycle. And building in security, so typically security happens at the end, so which we call reactive uh, approach to security. You do patch, you do testing, things which happen way after the things have been deployed. And there is this uh, philosophy of shifting left, which asks for a more proactive approach and bringing security in the start, in the beginning of the development life cycle. And, but that's actually not even, not even that is enough. Security maturity requires a continuous effort and a need for active awareness. So just doing once something is not going to help you and success in one area is not going to 
make sure that you don't have any vulnerabilities anywhere else. Now, just a quick recap of what a software development lifecycle looks like. Um, this is uh, a sample. It's, it's waterfall, but you could also hook up an agile approach on it if you run this cycle every time you do a sprint, for instance. So you start with an analysis of the requirements, then you do some design, then you implement that, then you test it, deploy it, and maintain it. And typically, security-related activities that happen in this context are, what is the most common security thing to do in this, in this context? If, if, you are you if you're in charge of the development of software, the software has been actually deployed already and, and it's being maintained and someone, someone tells you, hey, what, what about security? What did you do? And you know you didn't do anything so far. What are you going to do first? Alex? Put a firewall. Put a firewall? What if you already have a firwall? Pen testing overall. Pen testing, yes. What else? Find the firewall bugs and fix them. Patching. So the pen testing and patching are currently the state of the art. Well, the state of the practice, not state of the art. And the more advanced firms do architectural review analysis. And this is the workshop we had on threat modeling. So you, you try to look into possible threats in advance at the design level. Now, the problem is that with pen testing and patching, not as much with architectural reviews, you focus on bugs and not flaws. It's not cost efficient. And mainly, you don't really have, it's not security assurance. You don't have something going on all the time. And the, question, the good questions are, did you find all the bugs? What do you need to do to make sure these bugs don't, don't reappear? And bugs fixes might introduce new bugs. Oh no, I had another slide which is mixed up. So this is the, oh. so yeah, this is, this is what happened with OpenSSL, who have, has, we needed to issue a bug fix for a previous bug fix. And yeah, this is, this is a classic example when, when that sort of approach doesn't, doesn't really work. Uh, something's wrong with my slides. Anyway, uh, we go on. So an actual, an actual solution for that problem is having security everywhere in the life cycle. Uh, and this is a security assurance program, which is a structural and systematic approach to, to security. I'm not saying that pen tests and patching and this stuff is bad. No, no, it has to be part of your overall program and not happen just once in a while because your customers tells you, did you do pen testing? Um, now, like I said, the adding security to your process is pretty much agile com compatible. You don't really necessarily need a waterfall for that. So the idea would be to inject and do security on every sprint rather than, so you could call, in, incorporate security requirements in your sprint planning and make sure that they were actually correctly implemented uh, whenever you review the, uh, the sprint and push it to production. Um, yeah, the key difference, like I said, is that you add security incrementally Security requirements are not added all at once, but every time you do sprint, you check what would be the most applicable security requirements to add. Um, what are other approaches in addition to OWASP SAM? There are quite some uh, security initiatives out there. Uh, Microsoft uh, SDLC, Secure SDLC is the forefather probably of all of them. Um, and um, there, there are some others, um, it, it's not the point of this slide to go into each and every one of them, but I want to mention that they have some key elements in common. And the first element is that security is everybody's concern. You, you are already feeling that we are pushing, it's not like there are two or three people here that do security and all the rest doesn't have to know anything about it. The idea is that the security uh, champions, how we call them in the model, have to infect everybody else rather than be as a separate unit and, and stay as a separate unit. So you have to bring in the security knowledge from some champions, the champions that you have uh, selected to the full dev team. It has to be clear to, the, to everyone what, what is important for the organization, what, uh, what a risk is, so which risks are important, and things like security requirements, standards, security testing, and metrics are also essential. And these are the commonalities for all of these approaches. 
Okay, with all that being said, which that brings us to the OASP SAM model, which is an SDLC initiative. So OASP SAM is an AppSec program. Uh, it helps you uh, do several things. It helps you measure your current security posture. It helps you pr plan how you want to improve and it helps you follow that plan and demonstrate improvements. Now, there are, seven, there, are maybe, there are four key characteristics of the model that I want to mention. Um, the first one is that you cannot boil the ocean at once. So you cannot go from zero to hero in, in security. And if you look at the full SAM model and you don't do anything about security, you're going to get scared and you're going to, you're going to faint and you're going to close it and you're going to forget about it because it's huge. So the first, uh, the first key feature of SAM is that it tells you you should go iterative about it. So you should pick the things that are most important and then go in small steps, make sure that you keep on growing. The second, uh, the second key characteristic of SAM is that there is no single recipe that works for all organizations and SAM is built with this in mind, which results in some tricky issues that some things are not really applicable for all types of organizations, but that is by design. SAM, SAM is very high level. There are things which might not be applicable, but I would say that 99% of the things are applicable. Um, the third key characteristic, which is very much different from all these other models, SAM also tells you what you have to do to get there. And many security initiatives often fail due to lack of details. They just tell you you have to have secure build, but they don't really tell you what are the steps and what are the things that you have to check off to make sure that you have that. And yeah, the, the, the success of the program in general is, uh, should be defined in, si should be simple, based on a simple model, which is well-defined and is measurable. And that's exactly what Sam does. I'm not gonna talk too much about the history. Just wanna mention that the project has been there for more than 10 years. And it's been, uh, the initial version of the Sam was a PDF, which was funded by Fortify Software and just one guy created it. Uh, his name was Pravir Chandra, who was just an independent software consultant. And he then donated it to the OWASP uh, project. And so a couple of, uh, a small group of people got together and, and picked on the project and uh, blew a new life to the project and made sure that it stayed and it, and it, uh, and it evolved. And Gradually, the team grew bigger, and I would say that the major releases of, of OWASP SAM were 1.5 and uh, 2.0. 1.5 is from 2017, um, and the biggest change in terms of structure was that the, this PDF file was migrated to a repository where each uh, practice and each business function is uh, described in YAML files, so it's very easy to um, to have history and to update things. And actually everything is generated from these YAML files. The SAMI tool is also using the YAML files to, to generate and to add everything in the database. Um, okay, so what is SAM? I, I think I, I already said this. So SAM will help you evaluate your current security practices. It's gonna help you build an assurance program in, a, in an iterative way in small increments. It can help you demonstrate concrete improvements and everything should be based on measurements of these security related activities. On top of that, SAM is vendor agnostic. So you, the official model, well, the SAM model doesn't include any references to specific tools or methodologies. It is agnostic of that. And actually we have been building a guide to that illustrates a version of SAM with the tools and with the methodology, which is Sometimes it's easier to go bottom up and to see, okay, how are these guys doing it? I'm going to take that. I like that. I don't like that. That's not applicable for me. And I'm going to change that and use a different thing or a different tool. But yeah, I well, the, the model itself is generic. It fits any si size of company, small, medium, and large. And, and each different company can pick different uh, focus on activities and different maturity levels. It is not the point of the model to tell you yet that you have to be champion everywhere. There are maturity levels. I'll talk about them in a bit. 
uh, and it's not the purpose of uh, any organization. None of, no organization should try to get to a level three for everything. That would, be not, that would not be good use of your resources. Who is currently behind SAM? Well, it's a, we have an international team all over the globe. And the toughest thing is to schedule meeting times. Uh, typically, it's uh, evenings in European time, which is morning in New Zealand and afternoon in the US. Uh, and yeah, and once, once in a while, we get together uh, in, a, in a big house and then we work a weekend long to, uh, to improve the model and check things that, uh, that need to be updated or changed. Now, let's go to some structure. So at the top level, at the highest level, we have business functions and each business function is a category of security activities related to the essentials of software development. And there are five of them. Uh, then we have security practices, three per business function um, that build assurance for the related business function. And each practice is split uh, in two cohesive streams with three maturity levels. And each level is characterized by a successively more sophisticated objective that defi defined by specific activities. So every level makes it more complicated. Level one is typically very easy to achieve. Level three might be something that is impossible for a specific organization to achieve. Well, given their budget and their ambitions. And well, the good thing about the model, it's symmetric, but because not all of the models that I've mentioned are symmetric. Symmetricity is a nice property from a management perspective. On the other hand, not every activity is as important and it's also not as complicated. So some activities might take you way more time than others in terms of effort to achieve it. Um, I'm, this is a SAM 2.0 training slash presentation. Uh, so it's not the point to discuss the 1.5 model. I just want to mention that um, there are quite some changes going from 1.5 to a 2, and which happened in five years. So actually a new business function was added. There used to be only four. Um, and three extra practices were added. So there used to be 12, now there are 15, which is largely corresponds to the DevOps uh, philosophy and all the tooling that has come up to build and deploy software. This is the structure of the current uh, model. There are five business functions, three security practices, and each practice has two streams with three questions. In total, there are 90 things. So if you wanna, if, if you wanna go and say, we, we develop, we have an AppSec program, you have to look at, at 90 different, uh, well, some of them are related, but still there are 90 things which you need to cover and maybe 90 things where you need to improve. That's all about application security. By the way, SAM is about application security, it's not about organizational security. So things like uh, you need to lock your machines before you leave the room, that's not part, part of what SAM is. SAM focuses only on the software development part. Maintenance, of course, falls under this development. You do have governance, but the governance is for the development uh, of software. Um, again, a comparison between 1.5 and 2.0. I think we've been through this. Another thing which, so two essential things which have changed also. In 1.5, you used to have a, a question, do you train everybody for, uh, does, does everybody improve in development uh, life cycle, in software development life cycle, um, con um, attend security related trainings and security awareness trainings. And it, there used to be only two answers in the past, yes and no. And there was no middle, middle ground, which, is, which was very unfortunate uh, because if you have half of your team attending trainings, you would, if you say yes, then you don't get any money from the management to, to make sure that everybody attended them. If you say no, then you would be actually uh, you would be not giving yourself sufficient credit. So that has changed. So now you have between zero and one, you have yes for some and yes for many as typical answers. So you have four different answers. On the other hand, also quality criteria were added because in the past you just had the question and some description, but it didn't say like, 
These are the things that you actually must do to make sure that you qualify for this. For instance, again, if you want to make sure that everybody attends security trainings, you have to make sure that these trainings are organized for everybody onboarding the team. You have to make sure that these trainings are updated regularly so you're not following a training from 10 years ago. Things do change in security actually quite fast. And so there are quality criteria that tell you what you have to do minimally to make sure that you can say a, a partial yes. These are the two things that have been added and changed that I wanted to mention. Now, the full model in one, in one slide, like I said, this training, uh, the full one day training goes through each block, each and every one of them. And the training focuses on your own project on your own scope. So everybody defines their own scope and then we go into each of these building blocks. Uh, but we're not going to do that in this one hour session. Um, yeah. Now the business functions, they correspond to core activities that any software development firm does. So governance is typically organizational wide activity. So it's not something that you do for each project separately. Operations is also something that is often done in the on the organizational level. Uh, but all e each other uh, activities so design, implementation and verification is largely uh, dependent on a specific scope. And I will talk about scopes a bit later. So for each business function, these five business functions have three practices. I think I already mentioned this and each of them represent the activities that you should be doing in the context of your AppSec program. There are quite some dependencies uh, between these uh, practices. So for instance, security testing is largely related to security requirements. You have to have explicit requirements and then test them. These are uh, placed in design and verification, but in SAM, there is no actual ordering. You can pick anything from this model and start improving there. You don't have to go in this order. Um, and you, you don't, there are, there are, even if there are dependencies, you're free to do uh, as, as you have designed your strategy and your strategy should be based on your risk uh, exposure and your risk appetite, like I've mentioned. So if, for instance, if you're not working with external suppliers, you don't have to do anything there. You don't have to invest in that security practice. On the other hand, if you're building software, you should probably also check your dependencies on third party packages, making sure that there are no um, uh, vulnerabilities there and introduce uh, software composition analysis tooling to make sure that every time you release software, you don't have vulnerable dependencies, which can break your own system. Log4j, if you heard of it, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard of Log4j. And this is something that falls under uh, secure build uh, activity. Uh, we will go through it in a, in, a, in a bit. Now, like I said, then under each security practice, there are three levels of maturity which get more and more complicated. And uh, typically the first level is just the general understanding and ad hoc provision. So you don't really have to do you don't really have to be optimized. You should have covered a bare minimum there. Of course, if you have level zero, it means you don't have anything. That's a little bit out of scope here. Um, the level two is typically automation, level two maturity. And level three is mastery at scale. And you have to also introduce feedback loops to other activities. Um, I will give an example here. Uh, this is requirements driven testing. Uh, security activity. Um, so the objective at level one is to opportunistically find basic vulnerabilities and other security issues. What you would typically do is manual security testing, just making sure that your security controls are working as expected manually. And then you quickly and cheaply try to fuzz the system by trying all sorts of inputs and you try to break the system. Typically level one, like I said, it, it doesn't take much time to, to get to level one. It's also very ad hoc you, and, and the two go together. So if you want to have automation, it, obviously it's going to cost you more. Um, 
Level two is implementation uh, for, for, um, for the A stream. You're going to have test cases which are derived from security requirements. And then level B, uh, stream B is uh, misuse cases. So these are the positive and negative test cases which you then derive from your requirements. And the level B is more targeted than just fuzzing and throwing a tool at it. So you're actually going to try to figure out what would be a good input to try to break this thing. And you put it in tests. And actually the, the highest level of maturity in both streams is uh, having full automation. Uh, so you have regression testing for security tests, which include security unit tests and a denial of service uh, and security stress tests. Obviously we are targeting for level three here for our firm. Actually for level, for the stream B, we already have that to a certain extent. Alex will have a presentation on Friday showing how we do this. And for, uh, for stream A, we have Peter and Dimitar too, who will be working on that. And again, not every firm should look to achieve level three, by the way. So not for, it's not for everybody that you should go for the last, for the highest level. Depends on what your risks are and what your goals are. Okay, we're gonna go to the last part of the intro about OWASP SAM the assessment part itself. Um, and like I said, for every, there are 90 questions which go through all of these things. And every question has a, an answer going from no to many most, which gives you this many points on a scale from zero to one. And then uh, the maturity levels themselves go from zero, you don't do anything there, to one, which is a very basic and ad hoc provision and then you increase the difficulties and go to the full mastery. And again, you don't have to go to level three for everything. Um, this is, so this is what we call a coverage criteria, how much of your applications or how much of your team is doing that, how many people are, are following a, a security training between no to some people are doing or at least half are doing and, or many and most are doing. There are also quality criteria. So the quality criteria tell you, you have to do this, this and this for that level and if you don't do it you cannot give yourself any credit even if you're doing three out of four you can still say you can still not say a partial yes which is a little bit unfortunate because we used to have this binary criteria which said a binary coverage so it said zero or one and if you were in the middle you couldn't it was difficult to say one or zero we removed that but now we have this quality criteria which are kind of the same thing so you still, with the quality criteria, you have a zero and one, and, and it's a little bit of a discussion point in, in the team. Um, I am personally likely to be a bit more lenient uh, to take, to omit some quality criteria, but you have to be clearly rationalizing them. And not only me, other team members from the core team also have uh, the, same, uh, the same point of view. Now, how you do the, the SAM assessment, what do you do? Well, the official uh, SAM project offers you an Excel file. Uh, it's a very, very advanced Excel, to be honest. So you can do a lot of stuff with the Excel. It's an actual, it's almost a software product, but it's an Excel. Um, and you can, I'm not sure if you can read this stuff, uh, but basically you have all the questions in the Excel, you have the quality criteria, and you can pick an answer, uh, an answer which will give you a point, and then you get a, then you get a score which is an average, uh, the sum of the averages. Now, our firm has developed the SAMI tool, which allows you to do that as, as an actual, we have an actual product that, that does what the Excel does and even more. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the tool itself. Uh, it's not, that's not the point of the presentation. Uh, I just wanna mention that the tool is free to use. Uh, you can even use it in a non-registered version, so you can simply fill out the answers and then click on export. We're not going to store or process any of your data. Well, we're going to process this to generate the Excel, but then that's deleted immediately. We don't care about the data, your data. You can also register for the tool and invite your whole team to, to, be, to take part in it. So it's an actual management tool which goes way uh, beyond just an Excel file. Now, something 
still missing from SAM 2.0 is roadmap template. So in the last version, what we had is we had sample templates of if you're a, a product firm that develops products, you should probably pick these activities first and focus on them first. Once you have maturity there, then you could go to these other activities. So you would know more or less which ones you should pick first. Or if you're a bank, you should probably focus much more on governance and less on, I don't know, threat modeling, for instance. I'm just making stuff up. Uh, not sure if that, that was exactly correct. Uh, you can still access the old uh, roadmaps, but in version 2.0, there are no roadmaps, so you have to figure them out yourself. This is something that we will be, uh, this future work that's, that will be added. And that will be added ba based on the benchmarking project, which is work in progress. And the benchmarking project is that every firm out there would do their SAM assessment and send these results to the benchmarking project. And based on that, the benchmarking project will, first of all, you'll be able to compare yourself to other firms and to check what their scores are. Uh, you will also be, we will also be able to provide them the roadmap templates based on your, uh, how large is your firm and some criteria like that measure your, um, your profile, size of the firm, which industry you're active at, where are you located geographically, and a couple of more questions. Now, so that is, that is a little bit about the model. Now I want to say a couple of words about how do we adopt SAM. And there are some factors which you should take into account before you actually start adopting SAM. First of all, you should take into account your organizational structure, your current software development lifecycle, your goals, and you should set realistic goals, obviously. Don't try to boil the ocean. Try to approach it in an iterative way in small steps. Um, and you should also pick a manageable scope. Ideally, you should pick a small team who are very enthusiastic about software security and then introduce some uh, practices there, improve the security posture of that team in that scope and then try to grow from there. And there are things that any firm needs to take into account like budget, timing and resources. Um, you cannot have a security maturity program which is more mature than your software development program and, and your, uh, in general, your maturity. So your, if, if you don't have, um, if you use a very ad hoc development strategy, it is unlikely that you can automate everything at once. Uh, if you don't have things like uh, configuration, change release management, uh, vulnerability management, you will have some constraints in terms of your security program. So you should not try to jump over your maturity level in terms of your security. You should probably let them grow together or stay where your maturity is. And there are, again, when you're looking at your AppSec program, you should look into your teams, your development teams, your technology stacks that, are, that is being used. So not every team will have the same uh, approach to SAM. Your different technology stacks cannot be combined in one thing. So you cannot say, I'm going to set these standards for Java and I'm going to use it in every team. You will probably need separate efforts there. So every team will have their own pace and their own program. Um, and yeah, if you have an outsourced development, that's also not going to fit in your scope. This is why we are talking about scopes and selecting one scope and then growing from there. And unfortunately, right now, there is no guidance in SAM how to have how to answer to all of these questions. Okay, when, when you're selecting the scope, it could be the entire business, the entire enterprise, which is, if you're a small product firm that only has one product, that could work. If you're a huge outsourcing sweatshop and you have different teams, different projects, unlikely to work. Uh, you should probably focus on a smaller unit it's up to you to do this. Again, there is no, there is, there is some guidance which you can find on the website, but uh, it's, it's you who, who designs this. You should catalog your scope. 
so when you start the assessment, you should describe uh, which, which applications are in your scope, which teams are there, what assets do you have, and so on. And probably also what data is in scope in terms of uh, data types. I refer to the privacy regulation, for instance, it could be important for that. And then you can start introducing SAM. So how does that work? Um, now, the first step would be to prepare. So, like I said, you should define your scope. You should probably also talk to every stakeholder in that scope. And you should try to run a PR around that too. For instance, running an internal news flash saying, hey, we're gonna step up our security game and this is, this is the pilot team and we're gonna share the data once we, once we have uh, with everyone. Um, the, the smallest and easiest part, which is the biggest part of this training is the assessment. So there are 90 questions to go through, 15 practices. This typically takes not that much time. You talk to everyone or you, you can ask also everyone's answer by mail and then you fill out the Excel or you do it in the SAMI tool. And you will end up with a, with a score that tells you the current maturity level at the company. The next step would be to set the target. So once you have what are your current scores, from there you're gonna say, okay, which are the things that I'm gonna improve? Don't try to pick many things, pick a couple of improvements and then define the plan, define by when you're gonna, gonna try to do it, what do you need in terms of budget and who will, be, uh, who will be implementing that plan. For instance, you're going, you could say, okay, you know what, everybody from now on should follow security trainings and then you can pick some courses, make sure that uh, you validate that, those courses with everybody that is participating in your uh, SAM implementation, so everybody in the scope. And then you let everybody take the course and then you ideally you should be able to measure uh, the impact of that. And from there on, well, implementation is actually doing it. And then once they're ready, you could also then start rolling out that evangelizing those improvements and pushing them to the, the rest of the teams, especially if they are successful. And like I said, you have to be able to measure effectiveness so to convince your board to keep on investing in this initiative and to make sure that you, what you're doing is not useless waste of time for everybody. Now, that is SAM and how to introduce it. Does anybody have questions? Because the next part is we're gonna just focus on three different practices that, are, that we are doing it and that we're gonna pl plan to improve it. Um, and that is largely everything that I wanted to talk about today. But I want, at this point, I wanna ask if you have questions. Is it clear up to so far what I'm talking about? Okay, if, if it's not too clear, you will, you will see a bit more with some examples. So we're gonna focus on education and guidance. Um, this is where we have set our priorities, so everybody should be up to speed uh, with security. Everybody should have a security knowledge. Um, and I'm gonna now go into this activity and tell you what it covers. So the, largely in one sentence, the purpose of education and guidance is to teach a man to fish rather than to bring a fish to him. And one of effort is not sufficient. So it has to be, first of all, your training has to be regular and everybody has to pass through this training. And there also has to be a culture behind the organization. Uh, and more concretely, what, what now, what a good uh, implementation of this activity looks like first of all everyone receives regular trainings and regular core concepts trainings like the OWASP top 10, the web security fundamentals, threat modeling workshop. This training itself to tell you what what the whole idea is of, of an AppSec program. Um, 
So those are the minimums, which are typically easy trainings to follow. They are for everyone. Next is to have a role specific training. So for instance, Team Red would receive pen test training. People who are involved with containers would receive uh, Docker security trainings um, and so on. Um, the next nice to have, well, must have for us is to have the concept of security champions. So every team should have a security champion who is, who is uh, enthusiastic about security at the very least, but also has a lot of knowledge and tries to bring his, this knowledge in the project rather than just staying on the sidelines. And yeah, again, an important topic is that eventually every, all, all this knowledge should be shared internally uh, through workshops like this through trainings like this, rather than everything stays in a separate uh, corner. And these are the actual questions then. The first, question, the first uh, maturity level question is, do you require employees involved with application development to take SDLC training, the level one? And then you, like I said, you have several answers and quality criteria. I'm not gonna go through all the, all the quality criteria. But at, at this point, we, we know that for us, the answer is for most, of all, for most of us, it's required to go through these trainings. I would say that for everyone. Um, the training should be customized for per role. So um, like I just said, Team Red should follow Pentest trainings. Uh, security champions should have a little bit more advanced set of trainings. Um, and again, for us, I would say that most of us do this. If not, we are, we are also working on this regularly. And finally, something which we don't really do, uh, is whether we have a learning management system where we keep track of everybody's trainings. We, we are a small firm, so I don't think we really need this. I, I, we actually, I know actually more or less what everybody did. We do have track, uh, we do track whether everybody did the trainings. This is why this OWASP top 10 questionnaire was introduced to make sure that we cover that. It was a little bit of an experiment, by the way. It was not my purpose to, uh, to play a police here. Uh, but for a, for a level three, especially for a large organization, you would need to have an actual formal system where you track everybody and have an official certifications or attendance records. Um, this was stream A. In the stream B is whether we have a security champion for every development team. Level two is whether there is a software, secure software center of excellence, which is like a separate uh, unit or team with a clear role in the organization to promote software security. All the uh, software architectures that are defined are reviewed by this team, the pen test findings are reviewed by this team, and they are responsible for uh, promoting specific security tools and so on. I wouldn't say that we really have this as a special organ, but given our size, that is also not something that we should strive for. Uh, for a larger firm, imagine you have a firm of 1,000 uh, engineers, you would probably need this uh, formal thing to to have in place. And the last maturity level is to have a centralized portal where developers and security professionals can exchange opinions, can post stuff. I, I would say that we largely have this given our wiki and the Slack channel, specific dedicated Slack channels where communication takes place. It is also important to mention that, well, our wiki doesn't really report on any application security metrics, which is required for this. But our usage of, that, of those channels is pretty active. The purpose is not just to have a website nobody attends to and claim it that you get this level. Again, this has to be a pragmatic thing. You have to do this to make things better in terms of security, not just make this a, a thing and get your label and say, I have level three. That doesn't work like that. That's about education and guidance. Secure build is much more uh, practical and it, it largely focuses on the, the build process of your software, uh, which is then deployed, which is part of the secure deploy. We're not going to talk about it today yet. Um, 
and a secure build must deal also with third-party libraries. Now, what, it, what is good look like? Uh, you have build processes which are documented and repeatable. For us, it's, it's actually full automation uh, with the CI CD description documents. And build tools should be secured from unauthorized modifications, so nobody else should have access to the build tools aside from those who are uh, allowed to do this. I'm not sure who. I think everybody can manage and modify the build tools for us. So this should be perhaps uh, looked at, uh, that the CI CD description is not, not everybody that can touch the CI CD. On the other hand, everybody, if somebody modifies the CI CD, the rest of the team is going to see that and, and say, oh, what the hell are you doing? Um, but again, this is a, a maturity. Uh, there are maturity levels, and if you want to probably get a higher maturity level, you should, you should check that, especially if you're a large organization. Automated security testing tools and uh, some baseline which your pipeline enforces. Uh, we also have that in place. Um, like if your security, um, if our security tools fail, you cannot, your, your build fails and then you cannot proceed unless you fix that. The second stream or, or the good about the, the dependencies, the good part is that you need to what does good look like? You need to have software composition analysis tools that check for vulnerable components in your third-party libraries and check for license risks. Further up the line, you should also have a approved list of dependencies, something we don't do. So right now, if you need some uh, package, you just add it to the composer. Uh, the better practice is to actually vet every package, even versions to vet the versions in the package list um, and build will fail if you don't if you use some uh, unapproved dependency the first level is whether your build is formally described the first question well for us we can skip already to the second level where the build is fully automated we have that in place um, and the highest level is enforcing automated security checks in the build process. We do that by using static analysis tools. We can add also security tests, which will uh, enforce that as well. Um, and we also had this, the SBOM part, which is the second stream. So the second stream is, first level is, do you have knowledge about the dependencies you are using? We have a tool for that which is a, uh, actually it's part, already part of level two, which asks whether you handle third-party dependency risk by formal process. Um, in addition, like I said, you do need to actually have a list of approved dependencies to get to this level, to match this level, which we don't do. And the last one is you, pre you prevent the build, so you fail the build if there are any vulnerabilities. Um, and ideally, you should also get notification of new vulnerabilities for your software, which is already deployed. And the tool does that in normally that we are using. That was secure build. And finally, I want to talk about requirement-driven testing, something which we're going to do. Uh, which we are investing in. And the idea here is to test your software from a requirements perspective rather than just do a pen test or, or uh, or regular testing. And to start here, we actually need requirements. So security requirements have to be explicit so that people can start writing test cases for those. Your automation should be looking both into positive and negative test cases, and you should have regression tests for, uh, for uh, your requirements, which run on every build. Um, and the second stream deals with, I think we've been over, the, this was the example I gave in the beginning also. You have fuzzing, uh, misuse and abuse test cases, and denial of service uh, attack uh, 
based tests. So the first level is whether they are ad hoc manual tests largely for security controls. I do think we largely cover this. The second part would, have, would be to have automated tests to verify security requirements. And finally, to have this included in the build pipeline and to fail the build pipeline if things fail. And by the way, this also includes writing tests for all security bugs which have been identified at a certain point. I'm already adding that to the Trello normally. If there is something I fetch from issues or find once the software has been deployed, I typically add that to, to the Trello to be tested for. The stream B is about negative tests. So fuzzing, automated fuzzing, and we've been talking about this with Alex to have the dust tooling integrated here. Um, the second level is to have more intelligence, so not just brute forcing the fuzzing. Fuzzing would be like if you have an input, username, password, the tool would try to generate all sorts of crazy inputs and see if your server eventually gives a 500 error, uh, which would mean that something is dodgy in your, in your code. Um, Level two would be to do to hand made, make that, to tailor that towards your application, towards some uh, abuse stories, abuse cases. And the final level is to have denial of service tests, which Alex will show on Friday. That's it for today. And I'm open to questions.